I'm really excited to introduce the wonderful Dr. Joy Hardin Bradford. Thank you so much. I am so, so excited to be with you all this afternoon or this evening, I guess. Um, nice to see lots of familiar faces. Hey, Katrina, good to see you. Um, and just so thankful to have been um, invited to share with all of you this afternoon. Very, very excited to, to hear more from the young writers. Um, I think that that is, you know, I'm a little older now. And so, and my little ones are too young to kind of be in touch with what's really going on. Um, so I'm really hoping to kind of dig into what y'all are watching what you're listening to. Um, if you saw the prompt a little earlier and I saw some of you have already shared in the chat, um, I would love to hear what you would love to have more conversations about. Like, what do you feel like people are not talking enough about? So if you can drop those in the chat box, um, we can talk a little bit of that, about that a little later. Um, so I do want to just kind of start by telling you a little bit about how I got to this place where um, podcasting is how I make my living, which is really, really cool. Um, if you would asked me five years ago, this was not at all what I thought I would be doing with my life, but how um, pleasantly surprised I am that this is what I get to do for work. Um, so I am trained as a psychologist. I am originally from Louisiana um, and went to Xavier University of Louisiana for my undergrad degree in psychology and then did my master's degree in rehab counseling at Arkansas State University and got my PhD at the University of Georgia in counseling psychology. Um, and so after graduating with my PhD, much of my background has been in working in college student mental health. Um, so I have worked at the counseling centers at the University of Georgia, uh, but also Georgia Southern University, Virginia Commonwealth University, and before Therapy for Black Girls was my full-time job, I was the director of the counseling center at Clark Atlanta University. And so Clark Atlanta is pivotal for a lot of different things, but one of the most important things I think is um, there, I had a 45 minute commute back and forth to my job at Clark Atlanta, which is how I fell in love with podcasting. Um, so, oh, somebody's alma mater, yay! <laughs> Very cool, Panthers in the house. But I had such a long commute and for lots of people, they will tell you that they like look for things to fill that commute time. And so for me, it was podcasting. Um, so one of my favorite podcasts is The Read. Um, and this is a podcast by two friends who kind of talk about all things pop culture, what's happening in music. Um, and then they read somebody the riot act at the end, somebody who, night, who needs to get their life together. Um, so one of my absolute favorite podcasts, but also um, there's a podcast called Hidden Brain that talks a lot about like just the psychology of things um, that we don't think about, you know, like the psychology of gambling or, you know, different kinds of things. Um, so I just really fell in love with the medium. Um, I was already blogging on the Therapy for Black Girls website. So I actually started Therapy for Black Girls in 2014, but the podcast didn't come until 2017. Um, so in between that time, I had been blogging on the site, just talking about um, how do you find people for your support system? What kinds of questions do you ask a new therapist? How do I know if I need a therapist? Like those kinds of things. Um, and people were reading the blog, but I also still had my full-time job at the time. So I wasn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily have the same energy to kind of put into um, marketing it and making sure that people saw it. So some people were reading, but not nearly at the same rate as people listen to the podcast. Um, so like I said, I had been blogging on the site and then in 2016, um, I actually added the therapist directory to our website. So Therapy for Black Girls, kind of generally speaking, the entire platform is really dedicated to helping Black women and girls to prioritize their mental health. And I just really saw um, even in my work at college campuses, like Black women were not coming to the counseling center at the same rate as their peers. And so, you know, from my work, I know that there's lots of stigma related to counseling and therapy and mental health kinds of things in the Black community. So it felt really important to go to where they were um, to let them know, hey, I'm here. If you ever feel like you need to talk, you know, know that there's a therapist on staff who looks like you. Um, and so I kind of feel like I was doing therapy for Black girls before it was actually called therapy for Black girls. Um, but I added the therapist directory to the site because I kept seeing people online saying, I would really love to find a therapist who looks like me, but I can't find one. So it felt important to have a place where all of the Black women therapists um, could be found in one place. Um, so I started that in December of 2016 and then added the podcast in April of 2017. So a lot of the things I feel like really kind of added up to make it relatively easy for me to start a podcast. Um, so my husband actually has a degree or not a degree, he has a background 
in radio production. He used to be the executive producer for the Coco Brother Morning Show, um, which was a gospel show that kind of talked about like current events and stuff. So I knew that if I wanted to podcast, I already had like an in-home editor, which made it really easy to think about like, okay, somebody can do this for me in-house. So I recorded a couple of episodes and I probably sat on those episodes for like at least three months before I ever actually put it out. Um, and I was, you know, joking with Andrea about this before, um, just like listening to the sound of my voice is something that is still really difficult for me. Um, so even if I ever do listen back to my podcast, I only listen on 2x speed um, because something about just like listening to your voice just feels really, really uncomfortable. And so that's why it took me a really long time to even put out those free, those first three episodes. Um, but once I did put it out without very much marketing at all, it really kind of took off. Um, so we are kind of coming up on our four year anniversary in April. Um, and the podcast has already been downloaded over 14 million times. So much, much higher than people were reading the blog, like I said. Um, and really people just really, really have fallen in love, I think with the content, with the community, that we kind of cultivate around the podcast. And so it just is really, really cool that this is what I get to do and call my work at this point. Um, so for people who maybe are considering a podcast or thinking about how you might be able to use writing um, to tell your story through podcasts, I want this to be something that you kind of think about. So there is some kind of fluid conversation to my podcast. So some episodes I do by myself. Um, and other times I interview other therapists about whatever their specialty is. Um, so we've had episodes about things like emotional eating. How do you make friends as an adult? How do you be kinder to yourself? How do you know if you need a therapist? Um, but there is writing involved. So the episodes that I do by myself, I write out a script um, so that I know kind of generally what kinds of things I want to talk about. Um, but even the episodes that I have with other people, I do still script the questions and kind of think about what kinds of things I would want to ask the guests, but also leave room for it to, you know, kind of flow organically. What the other really cool thing is, I would love to see in the comments um, what kinds of podcasts you all are listening to, because there are other podcasts that are far more scripted than my podcast, right? So there are lots of like kid podcasts, um, one called Wow in the World, kind of like a science podcast. Um, there are, uh, there's a sports podcast that came out that came from the late Kobe Bryant's company called The Punies, um, which is kind of like a scripted comic kind of thing. Um, the Nickelodeon Network has like lots of cool like scripted kids podcasts. Um, so I would love to hear kind of what other things people are listening to. Do you listen to any scripted podcasts? Because, you know, probably not for some of our young writers, you will be way too young to know this, but a long time ago, there used to be stories like we watch on TV that played through the phone, right? Like that played on the radio. And so it kind of feels like we are returning to that through podcasts. Um, and the really cool thing I think also about podcasts is that a lot of podcasts are now being made into movies. So then your opportunities for writing expand even beyond just writing for the podcast. So there are just so many different ways that you can use your skills and creativity as a writer through the podcast medium. So let me check out some of the podcasts. Friend Zone is one of my favorites. Dear Hank and John, I haven't heard of that one. They give dubious, humorous advice. Okay, I have to check that one out. Making platonic queer friends. I'm thinking that's maybe something you said you want to talk more about. Mental illness happy hour is a good one. Teenage therapy, yes. Savvy psychologist, also a good one. Happiness Lab, Flores 404, Hidden Brain. That's the Perel's podcast I also love. Yeah, so just lots of good, um, there's a really good scary one. Um, now scary is not quite my forte, but if you like like thrills, um, the Lore podcast is a really good scripted podcast. And I feel like he has probably 10 or 12 writers on his staff because um, different people craft different episodes. Um, so again, just really want you to kind of keep your mind open to the ways that you can use writing in your career that might not necessarily look at just writing poetry or writing a book or writing novels or those kinds of things. Um, be open to the other things that you can use your writing skills for as well. Another really popular class of podcasts are sleep podcasts. So podcasts, so if anybody has like downloaded the Calm app, 
um, or Headspace app, you know, they have like these sleep stories. They're also entire podcasts dedicated solely to like stories that help you to fall asleep at night. So people who kind of need just a little bit of ambient sound in the background to help them sleep. That's a whole class of podcasts that are really, really popular. Um, so again, people like will write new fiction stories or kind of recycle maybe some of their work to read as a sleep podcast. So there really is no limit to how creative you can be with podcasting. And the other thing is that the barrier to entry is really, really low. So it's just to get started, all you really need is your phone or whatever device you're using to join us tonight. Um, that's really all you need to get introduced to the, to the field of podcasting. So that's the other thing that makes it really cool. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the part of listening to your voice is difficult, but also editing takes a really, really long time. So this yeah. is the part that I feel like I wish I would have known before I started a podcast. Um, so when you listen to a podcast, it sounds really effortless, right? Like it sounds like, oh, this is just a person talking or two friends talking, right? But what you don't recognize for a good podcast, right? So you don't necessarily want to just share like raw footage with no editing to kind of chop down like silences mm -hmm. or anything um but like really nicely edited podcasts for like a 30 to 45 minute podcast you're probably looking at five to seven hours of work at least for the therapy for black girls podcast so there's time involved in like researching what we're going to talk about who's going to be the guest if we need a guest. We typically do a pre-interview to kind of see, um, you know, what kind of guest, what kind of experience the guest has. Then we have to schedule them. We have to record. Then there's the editing of the conversation. There's an uploading and then sharing it with the world, right? The other thing, right? Like you already heard me say that it takes it took me like three months to just even like release those first episodes, but you can't get to episode 100 if you never share episode one, right? So I think it is um, an exercise in like being compassionate to ourselves and really kind to ourselves, because if our best friend released a podcast, and even though it might not be really great, we probably would be really encouraging like, oh, congratulations, you did a great job, congrats on releasing it to the world. But sometimes when we talk to ourselves, that voice is much more critical. It's much harsher than the voice that we use with our best friends. And so I feel like podcasting and sharing it with the world um, is a great opportunity to kind of exercise some compassion towards ourselves and being much nicer. And you do get better, right? Like the, the more you do it, like Vicky already mentioned, the more you edit, as tedious as it may be, you do get better. It gets a little easier. Um, you know what kinds of questions you maybe want to ask your guests if you're going to have guests. You can think about, okay, these are the points I'd like to to make if it's a solo episode. Um, so you do get better, but you can't get better if you don't actually start. Yeah. So in most cases, if you are not like doing an, a podcast with like a recording company or with like the artist, you probably want to stay away from playing even small clips of music um, because there are copyright infringement things. And then your entire podcast gets taken down because it gets flagged by the label. Um, now there are some companies who have been able to do it. And I feel like um, Anchor, um, which is a part of Spotify, recently rolled out a program. So there are ways that you can make a podcast through this program called Anchor. And since Spotify is already a music company, I feel like they have some kind of, uh, what do you call it? Like some kind of plan where they allow you to maybe play clips of music in a way that is fair and like copyright protected. So that may be something that you want to look at um, to see like what kinds of uh, services may be offered through Anchor um, because they may have done some of the legwork for you. But yeah, you do want to be careful um, depending on what kind of podcast you're thinking of making sure you have releases signed. Um, so any guest who comes on the podcast, I have them sign a release giving me permission to use their voice. Um, and if you're going to kind of be using any kind of music or any kind of intellectual property belonging to someone else, you do want to have the appropriate clearances. So I thought of part of our time um, this evening, we could listen to a couple of my solo episodes, um, ones that I feel like are particularly poignant for us as young people, um, and some of you younger than I. Um, so the, the first episode that I want to play a little bit from is an episode called Keep Your Eyes on Your Own Paper. So are teachers still telling students to keep their eyes on their own paper? Drop a one in the comments if, if you've heard that before. Maybe that was only in Louisiana. <laughs> okay, Chelsea agrees. All right, 
So now I'm, I'm not too far off. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so this is an episode called Keep Your Eyes on Your Own Paper. Um, and both of these episodes will be solo episodes. And then I would love for us to do a little journaling after we've listened to the clip. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me for session 94 of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. Today, I wanted to share my thoughts about something that seems to be coming up more and more in my conversations with many of you, and that's comparing yourself to others. When I was in elementary school, probably around third or fourth grade, I distinctly remember the teacher telling us to keep your eyes on your own paper before we started taking any tests. This, of course, was a not-so-subtle reminder not to borrow any of our neighbors' answers. But I also think it's a great reminder for whatever stage of life we find ourselves in now. If you're honest with yourself, are there some ways you've been too busy looking on your neighbor's paper that you didn't even realize that you already knew all of the answers to the questions? You know what I mean. How many times have you changed your mind about how you were going to style your hair because so-and-so's hair looks super cute? Or... How many times have you decided that the focus of your business would be one thing, but then that new thing that so-and-so is selling looks really good? I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to be inspired by others. Inspiration is important and necessary in some cases. But don't call it inspiration if it's really you trying to borrow your neighbor's entire life. Here are a few reasons why this can be really dangerous for you. Number one. If you spend too much time comparing and coveting what you see others enjoying, it becomes difficult for you to trust your own ideas and intuition because you're not really exercising these muscles. In order for you to really be in tune with your creativity, you have to spend time with it. You have to let it run wild and pay attention to where it leads you. And you can't do that if you have too much energy invested in what other people are doing. Number two, none of us ever really have access to anyone else's full story. So you see the highlights that someone shares on social media, or you notice someone else who looks like they have it all together on campus or at work. But do you really know the whole story? More often than not, we're trying to piece together a story that is at best incomplete and more than likely inaccurate. So when we make a judgment about ourselves based on inaccurate information about someone else, it's kind of like building your new house on quicksand. It's destined to be a disaster. Number three, you miss out on all the dopeness of celebrating the things in your own life. When we're too focused on what other people are doing, we lose sight of what incredible things we have to offer and can become less grateful for these things as well. And number four, it becomes difficult for you to really tap into the thing that only you can birth into this world. So I was listening to an episode of the Hidden Brain podcast one day, and they were interviewing a researcher who studies what happens to a local community when the local newspaper closes. And I thought to myself, what an interesting thing to study. I wonder how he came up with that question. And then it dawned on me that, of course, I wouldn't come up with a question like that because that's not a part of the work that I was designed to do. It's his work. So the lesson to me there was to stay focused and in tune with the work I was designed to do and the gifts that I was designed to share because anything else is a distraction. And that's what I want to pass on to you. What thing is the world waiting on you to cultivate and share? What is the world missing out on because you've got your eyes on your neighbor's paper? So, of course, I know that this isn't always an easy task, especially with the popularity of social media and the ease with which we have access to so many different people's lives. So here are a few tips that might help you to get a little bit better with this if you're struggling with comparing yourself to others. Number one, unfollow, unfriend, or mute. Anyone who doesn't make you feel cute enough, loved enough, thin enough, fashionable enough, smart enough, whatever enough, 
continuing to interact with people and accounts on social media that are always making you feel like you're behind is probably not motivating you and it's more than likely stunting your growth. So go ahead and get rid of these accounts and these people that you're following. Number two, do an honest assessment of the various areas of your life to see where there may need to be a little more attention. Sometimes when we find ourselves caught up in the comparison trap, it's because we're avoiding doing the necessary work in our own lives. So do you need to be spending more time tending to your physical health? Or is there something going on at work where you do need to be getting caught up to speed? Pay attention to what really comes up for you when you feel the need to compare and judge. And then focus that energy on doing something that will actually improve yourself or your situation. Number three, keep a gratitude journal. A daily or regular account of the small and large things that you are grateful for in your own life can help you to stay focused on those things and to welcome more of this into your life. Where we devote our energy is what we see appear. So focusing on things you're grateful for shifts your focus more to abundance than lack. And finally, number four, focus on building authentic and genuine relationships with other people. Not as a way to try to steal anybody's secret sauce, but to truly get to know them and their story. Once you actually get to know people, they're no longer random frames on a page or fictionalized stories. They become complex and layered and human just like you. So tell me if comparing yourself to others is something you've struggled with in the past or if you're currently struggling with and what kinds of things have you done to help you manage this? Share your thoughts with me on social media using the hashtag TBG in session and definitely make sure you share this episode with at least three other people because this is something that I know many people struggle with. Before we wrap up, I also want to share a very special project I've been working on. Wow, now see, that was an experience and an experiment for me and like actually listening to my voice and like one time speed. I'm like, oh, that's good information. <laughs> right, so that's, that's the other thing, right? Is that sometimes when you are putting something out there in the world to share with other people, like you don't see it with the same eyes and ears that other people do. And then you take a step away. So that was session 94. I just released session 193. So I've done at least a hundred more sessions since then. In, right um so you get to kind of look at the material with new eyes which is kind of cool so I would love to um, have us spend some time journaling um, with the prompt I find myself comparing myself to others most often when so when are those times when you find yourself doing a lot of comparison to others I don't want 
gonna fill those metal bags. Yeah, it's like cranes in the sky. Sometimes I don't wanna fill those metal bags. I tried to run it away. Thought then my head be feeling clearer. I travel 70 states Thought moving around make me feel better I tried to let go my lover Thought if I was in London maybe I could recover To write it away or cry it away Don't you cry it, babe So I am already seeing some of you share in the chat, which I appreciate. Um, so something else that I think is important, and I should have said this um, begin in the beginning before you started writing, um, is that when you are journaling around topics like this, it's really important to get in a space of allowing yourself to free write without actually judging what you're saying, right? Especially when we're already talking about comparison. Um, and so I don't want you to kind of look at what you've written and say, oh, I should feel bad, right? Or to kind of be critical or guilt yourself for having these feelings. These feelings are completely natural. Feelings of jealousy and regret and all of those things are completely human emotions. Um, this is just a, an opportunity for you to share and to reflect on how you might be feeling. Um, so really resist that urge if you're having to judge what you've written and really allow yourself to just share. So do we want to move into the second um, episode? So the second episode that we are going to play a clip from um, is called Nice For What. Um, so drop a one in the comments if you enjoy that song by Drake. Nice For What. <laughs> Lots of ones. Okay, yeah. So this, this episode was inspired by that. 
Um, so one, I just love bounce music. I'm from Louisiana. Y'all will hear me talk about that in the episode. Um, but I also think that it is just a good question for us as um, young people and young writers to kind of contend with, especially as women who are as people who have been socialized as women, um, to think about like, what am I really being nice for? Um, so we'll go ahead and play that clip. Giveaway. Now, those of you who know me in real life know that my little Louisiana heart beats incredibly strong for a bounce track. So you know that Nice For What has been playing a ridiculous amount of times in my truck in the past couple of days. And not only do I think that this is a strong contender for Song of the Summer, it's also just a great feel-good track. Drake's words also inspired me to think deeper into the question, nice for what? Who is served by our niceness? And why are so many of us invested in it? Of course. I think that much of it is related to societal expectations. You know the old saying, girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice. And some of it is historical, as niceness definitely served as survival mechanisms for our ancestors. But how much of niceness is actually tied to our individual difficulties with being assertive, using our voice, and taking up space? To answer this question, you'll likely need to take a deep dive into some childhood stuff, which is one of my favorite places to dig. What were you taught about using your voice as a child? If you're like me, then it wasn't uncommon for you to hear things like, little girls should be seen and not heard. And given messages like this, it's quite logical that many of us might grow up feeling like our opinions don't matter and maybe aren't even valid. You also want to consider, what was your relationship like with your parents or other caregivers as a child? Were you treated in a way that made you feel like you were only lovable if you behaved a certain type of way, or if you were only one type of person? In many ways, any behavior that we've held on to for some time probably served a purpose at one point. Our job is to figure out whether it still serves a purpose. So yes, niceness may have been important and necessary as a child, but how is it working for you now? And I do want to make sure that you understand what I'm saying here. I don't think there's anything wrong with being kind. Kindness to me means being respectful and showing common courtesy. It's great to be kind. And it's also fine to be nice if the niceness doesn't come at your own expense. Are you somebody who struggles with this? Here are some ways that you will know if this need for niceness is showing up in your life. Do you have trouble voicing your needs and wants in relationships of all kinds? Have trouble doing things like asking your boss for that promotion? even though you have solid documentation indicating the value you bring to the company? Do you have difficulty asking your professor to look at that essay again because you know that you made some very solid points? Do you have trouble asking for the correct order, even when you know you said chicken and the server brought out fish? Or what about this? You struggle because you are going with your friend to sip and paint for the third time this month, even though all you really want to do is be home in your PJs watching Netflix. While some of these examples may seem trivial, and they may be in some cases, the cumulative effect of being too invested in niceness can be detrimental. Because when we struggle with assertiveness or setting boundaries, it usually doesn't just show up in one area of our lives it shows up in multiple areas. So when we don't set boundaries or communicate assertively, the only one that usually ends up getting the short end of the stick is us. So what can we do about this need for niceness? Here are three tips. One, get comfortable with the idea that those invested in your niceness may be put off by you divesting in it. If you're someone who has a real need to be liked, 
this will likely be very difficult for you. Learn to sit with and lean into the discomfort as opposed to giving into it. What do you feel immediately when you feel like you're disappointing someone or not being nice? Do you feel it somewhere in your body? You get stomach aches, headaches, maybe some tension in your neck. Do you experience shame? Getting in touch with what your reaction is can help you explore more of what it's about and how you can manage it. Tip two, write it out. What are you so afraid will happen if you're perceived as not being nice? So let's say you do tell your friend that you don't want to go to sip and paint this week. What will happen? And if this is an issue for you, I actually want you to take pen to paper and write out these scenarios. So what will happen if you don't go to sip and paint this week? She might go with someone else. And then what? And then this other person and her will get close. And then what? She'll begin to like this other person more. Okay, and then what? She won't want to hang out with me anymore. Ding, ding, ding. Now we've gotten to what the fear really is. It's about you feeling like you'll be left behind or not valuable anymore. That's where the work is. Talking to a therapist about this piece would likely yield some incredible growth for you. And tip number three, start small. So maybe you don't give up your niceness immediately by going to your boss tomorrow and asking for a raise. But could you start by saying that you want Pizza Hut instead of Papa John's on Friday night? What are the little ways that you can begin to be more assertive and start to be less concerned with being nice? I'd love to hear how others of you have gotten over the need to be nice or whether you feel like this is something that you're still struggling with. Share your thoughts with us on social media by using the hashtag TBG in session and make sure to tag the accounts. You can find us on Twitter at therapy for the number four B girls and you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at therapy for black girls. If you'd like to continue the conversation. All right, so we have another prompt. So the second prompt is, what are you afraid will happen if you are perceived as not so nice? See, she's
I'm gonna need a copy of this playlist so I can sing along afterwards. <laughs> okay. I would love to hear um, before we run out of time if other people have questions either related to the prompts or just podcasting generally. So I want to be sure that anybody who's like, oh, I gotta get this podcast out next week um, can, can get this launched tonight if you can. So somebody just sent a question. Um, that they're not sure they're not sure if I mentioned this, but can you talk about how the, you made the podcast your full time job? Absolutely, yeah. So um, most recently, the podcast has joined the iHeart Podcast Network, um, which is kind of like I so I signed a record deal basically with the podcast. Um, so the iHeart Podcast Network distributes the podcast um, and is also responsible for selling ads on the podcast. Uh, but the other ways I was monetizing it before I joined the iHeart Network. Um, is because I have the therapist directory. So the therapist pay to be on the directory and the podcast is a really good lead generator. So I am speaking to thousands of people every week saying, hey, if you wanna go deeper with the topics that we've talked about in the podcast and you wanna connect with somebody in your area, visit our therapist directory at therapyforblackgirls.com slash directory. Um, so that was also um, not necessarily like a direct monetization, but definitely drives lots of traffic to, um, to the directory. So um, that is how I also monetize. And like I said, my clients. Um, so I do have a very small caseload. I only see like two or three people a week, um, but all of those people found me through the podcast. So ads are the most um, traditional way I think people think about like monetizing a podcast but there are also a lot like lots of people have podcasts strictly for as a lead generator to like lead people to whatever their course is or if they have a group that they're running or if they have like a book that they're selling right all of the podcast content then drives people to that next thing um, so that's another way to to monetize the podcast in addition to ads um, Stephanie's asking, how do you market? Um, so right now, all of the marketing for the podcast has been strictly word of mouth. Um, you know, so I really feel like if you make good content that people want to talk about, then they tell their friends, right? You know, so it's not uncommon for us to get screenshots of group chats, um, people talking about the podcast or somebody sharing it in the Instagram stories. And also I call, I give a call to action at the end of every episode saying, hey, text two or three of your friends right now and tell them that they got to check out this episode. And you want to say that kind of throughout the episode so that you're kind of training your, your audience um, to share it with other people. Okay, let's see. Amanda's saying, I'd like to subscribe. Also wants to know what advice you have for a technophobe without a technical spouse. Um, so Amanda, there are tons of people who do like freelance uh, editing. Um, so if you go on a site like Fiverr or Upwork, um, you can find people who will edit your episode for something like $25 to $50 um, an episode. You also want to like get really familiar with the podcasting community. So there are tons of like Facebook groups. There are lots of Instagram accounts and things that you can follow um, for people who may be familiar with Clubhouse. If you're on Clubhouse, there are lots of podcast communities popping up there. Um, so there are tons of ways to kind of get connected to people. And you can ask in one of the Facebook groups like, hey, does anybody know a great freelance editor? and you'll get tons and tons of um, recommendations, but you can also look on one of those freelancer, spot, um, freelancer websites. What's the criteria to getting monetized? Do you have to be sponsored? Um, so for traditional sponsors, Jordana, um, you usually have to have about, they usually want you to have between, or any, anything more than like 10,000 downloads per episode within the first 30 days of release. Like that is how like traditional marketing people kind of measure um, whether they're going to spend money for the podcast. But if you have a really niche podcast, like let's say you have a podcast all about sneaker culture, right? Even if you don't have 10,000 downloads per episode, but you have a super engaged community, you may still be able to monetize your podcast 
like partnering with a local um, sneaker store or um, maybe an artist who's really into sneakers. So the traditional ways of, of advertising don't have to be the end all and be all. Um, you can look at lots of different ways, again, especially if you have really niche kinds of content to really partner with people um, who would be interested in getting in front of your audience. Okay, another question. How do you expand your podcast? I want to reach more people my age. I have a social media account. I connect you to the account and my friends help share. How do I reach more people? Also, would it be possible to email you and talk about your podcast? Absolutely, you can email. Um, the, the email address is info at therapyforblackgirls.com. Um, so marketing, I think, is really about asking very directly, like I said, for people like, hey, if you enjoyed this, share this with your Instagram story or share this in your group chat. Um, I also think it's important to kind of think about where your listeners are spending their time and trying to get in front of that audience. Um, so if you have like a music podcast, let's say your podcast is about like people who play in the orchestra, maybe you go to your local orchestra and say, hey, can you send out information about my podcast on your newsletter? Or are you asked to, you know, kind of spend some time at the beginning or end at a, of a meeting to tell people about, hey, this is my new podcast. So the other thing that's really cool about podcasts is that people don't tend to just listen to one podcast, right? So um, those of us who are deep into podcasting, you will listen to multiple podcasts a week. And so one really great way that I've also grown the podcast is to be a guest on other people's podcasts, right? So being a guest on podcasts that are similar to, um, you know, your listeners is another great way for people to kind of find out about the podcast. Can you talk about equipment you're using, what you started out to begin with? Um, so what I started out with in the microphone that I still use is a $50 microphone I grabbed off Amazon. Um, I think it was like a Black Friday sale, so it might be like $75 now, but you do not have to invest a ton of money in podcasting. I typically tell people just to kind of get a feel for it, to know if it's really going to be something that you're going to stick with, is just use your headphones that come with your phone and your voice recorder. Use your voice notes app to do a couple of test episodes to see if this is something that you're gonna stick with, um, how much editing in, is involved, do you really have the bandwidth to stick with this? Um, because the other thing is that you really wanna be consistent with podcasts. So podcast audiences um, will like craft their entire schedule around their favorite podcast. So my podcast drops on Wednesday mornings at three o'clock um, Pacific time. So people know that if they're going on their morning run or with their morning coffee, they know that the Therapy for Black Girls episode will be waiting for them. If for some reason it's not, we get lots of emails and tweets saying, hey, where's the podcast, right? So that's the other thing is that you really want to kind of map out, do you have the bandwidth um, to actually keep up with a uh, weekly or bi-weekly? Now your audience will adapt to whatever your schedule is, but you need to stick to whatever you've told them it's going to be because otherwise they don't know when you're gonna show up, how loyal should I be if she doesn't know she's gonna show up. Um, so you just wanna stick to whatever schedule it is that you have. Yeah, Andrea, yeah, yeah, they, they are, they love to kind of schedule and kind of think about, okay, when, when am I gonna listen to my favorite podcast? Especially now that lots of people are still home, right? Um, so your commute is not the same. So they're making new schedules and new rituals around some of their favorite podcasts. There was one um, question in the chat that I think okay. segues in well into what you just said, and maybe we can make that our last question. Okay. Um, Amber asks, uh, where'd it go? Amber asks, how do you decide on topics? And I think also blending that with the question of like, how do you know if you have enough to talk about, right? For more mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is always the fear, I think, when people start, it's like, oh, I'm gonna run out of topics. So the idea is that you wanna choose something that's like, wide enough for you to go narrow, right? So you wanna pick something that like, you're not gonna get tired of talking to talking about, but that you can go really deep with this one topic. So think about the kinds of things that you would kind of just naturally talk about anyway. Um, like we had that prompt in the beginning to kind of think about what kinds of conversations are you not seeing happening and you'd like to see them? Sometimes that means that it's you that has to start the conversation that you're not seeing. Maybe that is the thing that you need to be doing. Um, and to also know that you can play with your content, right? So sometimes, like I said, it's just me on the episode. Sometimes I have a guest. 
Sometimes I'm talking about a TV show or a book that a lot of people are reading. So you can also get creative. Like every, the way that your podcast starts is not the same way your podcast is going to look by episode 150, right? So also give yourself the flexibility and the leeway to know that it can change forms and, you know, just kind of be open to the creativity that it might take of itself. And I just want to encourage everyone here to unmute themselves just very quickly and just cheer, clap, give Dr. Joy all the love and praise. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All of it. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Joy. I want to encourage everyone to keep up with Dr. Joy and her work. You can follow her on Instagram and on Twitter at Hello Dr. Joy. You can follow Therapy for Black Girls on Instagram, just using Therapy for Black Girls, and on Twitter, Therapy Number Four B Girls. Um, there you can keep up with all of the insights. Um, Therapy for Black Girls puts out great content too to match with the episodes. <laughs> So it sounds like all of us in here need some wellness tips, which I'm with y'all. So definitely keep up. And of course, you can listen to the Therapy for Black Girls podcast about all things mental health and personal development everywhere podcasts are available to listen to. So do that. Um, Dr. Joy, you are absolutely amazing and incredible. And thank you for your time and your generosity today. Oh, we're so thankful for you. Thank you all for having me. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to finish up. I have to first, of course, always say thank you to the people, the essential workers who are still out there working essentially for us in many different ways, doctors, nurses, grocery store workers, dog walkers, and of course, organizers, some politicians, not all, but some, and we're thankful for them. And um, some of you are here tonight, right, coming back from work, and so we really appreciate that. And um, we're glad that you can find us and, and find ways to keep taking care. And we know that we don't do the seven o'clock clap anymore, but that doesn't mean that we're not still here for you and cheering you on. So thank you all for being here. I know that there are a lot of people who aren't from Girls Right Now or may not be involved in Girls Right Now as the audience. Um, Dr. Joy has such an expansive network of people and of people who listen to her voice and crave her voice. So I want to encourage you to get involved with Girls Right Now. There are tons of different ways. You can donate at girlsrightnow.org slash give. You can become a circle member with special benefits at girlsrightnow.org slash circle. Or you can go to girlsrightnow.org slash inquiry if you're interested in being a mentee or a mentor. Girls Right Now is a mentoring program where we pair professional writers with, um, with high school teens. So if you're interested, there are tons of ways. You also saw at the beginning, there's ways to be wellness advisors, which is a volunteer position. If you're a speaker, you can do that. So go to girlsrightnow.org. There's tons of ways you can be involved beyond just donating. 